So chatting about the topic of sleep is definitely one of our most common themes here in the household. And obviously it's a conversation with every single person that comes into our clinic and for so many different reasons, but we, we got to dive deep today with, a, with an amazing guest. Yeah, and we often don't recognize all the different factors that are influencing our sleep and why it's so important. Yeah, and we just came off of a, a time change experience here across the globe. And, you know, this time of year is typically a more enjoyable time of year for that time change because you get an extra hour of sleeping in. But I think we take um, for granted just the impact of what even that one hour does to us, you know. And so uh, talking about all of these things, pl uh, places where people are stuck, uh, how to optimize your sleep, what's actually happening, what are the detrimental effects to long-term sleep deprivation, et cetera. These are all things that we discussed today with Devin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and what I loved is that our conversation took the angle of mindset and how that is the most important factor in insomnia and in sleep deprivation and all the different things that are going on and not so much the physical things that we sometimes think we need to do. So I love that we brought in that angle and he was really able to illuminate that relationship for us. And the funny thing about this episode is I didn't get a lot of good sleep last night and I think yours was maybe okay because our kids have been sick and I literally look like I just woke up. <laughs> And here we are having this conversation with a sleep expert. Yeah, it's funny actually. This the last week almost uh, has been a little bit rocky in the Jensen mm -hmm. home. So having these conversations definitely hit home, especially when you are in the middle of uh, a bit of sleep deprivation yourself. You're off your routine, and and so we talk about routines and how to get back on track and how to optimize some of these things that that maybe we have been paying attention to or not. Uh, but when we do go off of our rhythm, wow, the impact is huge. Mm -hmm. right? Absolutely. So enjoy. Get your cup of tea in a blanket and listen to the sleep episode. Enjoy. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Health Ignited. I'm here with my lovely wife, Dr. Sonia Jensen, and we're going to be talking to an amazing expert in the field of one of our favorite subjects, right? Yes. I mean, sweet. this is a conversation we have every day. That's true. You know, after having kids and now we're going on year 10 and especially in the last week where two of them are not feeling so well, sleep is not um, as optimal as one would want it to be. Definitely. So, you know, we, we had a podcast, uh, you and I, about this uh, not, too, not too long ago and we were kind of highlighting some of the factors that we like to address. Um, but this is a reason why we wanted to bring on uh, Devin Burke. So Devin Burke, if you don't know him, uh, he did a TED Talk, he wrote a book. And the book is called The Sleep Advantage, How to Win the Night uh, to Own the Day. And uh, so we're going to dive into all things related to sleep, how to optimize it, look at the hormones uh, and how all these things are related. So Devin, thank you so much for being here on the podcast with us today. Yeah, I'm excited to be here and uh, talk with you guys. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, there's there's so many different things to discuss when it comes to sleep, but I, why don't you tell us a little bit about why you decided to put your attention in this area and why this is so important to you? Yeah, I mean, I, I realized I was ignorant to the fact that sleep is is the foundation of health. You know, I, I had studied a lot of things, nutrition and exercise physiology and psychology. And over a decade, I, I, I really immersed myself in a lot of the things that affect our, our health and performance. And I never really, I thought sleep was a waste of time. I, I'm a great sleeper. It's like a superpower of mine. And someone I, I knew that I was actually working with had issues with insomnia and he, he asked for help. And I was like, Hey, listen, I don't know anything about this. So I looked into what was available which was pretty much just sleeping pills. And I was like, wow, this is not a good solution. And then I started to really understand by diving deeper about the science of sleep, how important it is, how it affects our hormones, how it affects our relationship, our longevity, our creativity. And I was like, wow, I can't believe that this was something that I hadn't came across it was, you know, something I just took for granted anyway. So the more I learned about it, the more I got interested in learning about it. And so that dove, I dove deep into, you know, science of sleep and, and really then started to think, well, how can I use all the things that I learned over the last decade to really help people improve their sleep, you know, and, and really what is the psychology of sleep? And that's really where a lot of people get stuck is, is, and we, I'm really looking forward to sharing a little bit about, um, you know, the mindset around sleep, because there's so much more psychology to sleep than people realize. Um, but yeah, that's what got me so interested in it. And then I just kept learning and then 
Sleep Science Academy was founded. And here, here we go, you know, five years later doing a TEDx talk and a book and, you know, all the things. So it's, um, yeah, I, I truly believe it's, it's the foundation of health. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that's where we should go next is the mindset piece. Cause we often talk about mindset in so many different areas of our life, like our hormones, our relationships, and just all the decisions we make every day. And I would love for you to tap into that a little bit about the psychology of sleep and our perception. And you know how you were speaking to, you thought it was a waste of time. And I think there are many people out there that feel the same. And then, you know, moms like me that have like young kids where sleep sometimes isn't an option in the first couple of years. And it's Mm -hmm. so broken. If you can just kind of, yeah, illuminate the mindset piece for us. Yeah, it's important to understand. I mean, a lot of people don't prioritize or protect sleep because they don't know how valuable it is. So there's there's a lot of different buckets when we talk about you know the psychology of sleep. But I like to start in this bucket because it's important. Unless you know how important it is, you're not going to prioritize and protect it. You're not going to do things to optimize it. You're not going to you know do you you're really not going to structure your life the way that you could so that you get great sleep. And yet, and it's challenging because. You know, we all have nights or weeks or months of bad sleep. It's normal. And it's what's tricky, though, is people get stuck in these, these loops, these paradoxes, and then it continues. And this is where it gets really tricky because there's a lot of paradox in sleep. Like sleep's the one thing that the harder you try at, the worse you get at. And I, we get people all the time in our program that are moms that had kids and their kids weren't sleeping, so they weren't sleeping. And then their kids started to sleep, but then they never went back to being able to sleep because they started to get anxious about sleep. And then they tried all the things, the supplements, maybe they even went to prescriptions, and those things were band-aids, so they didn't help. And then they got stuck in this, this paradox of being stressed about their sleep. And so this is like a very common sort of situation for, for young moms. Um, women tend to have more sleep challenges than men, especially because of later in life with the changes that a, you know, a woman's body goes through. And so there are a lot of challenges and and depending on who we're talking to and what stage of life they're in, there's different mindsets and things to be aware of. Um, for instance, high achievers, entrepreneurs, business owners, which is another demographic that we work a lot with. They have the, uh, the, the challenge of shutting their mind down. You know, maybe they get that it's important, but they're always problem solving. They're always thinking, well, hey, what do I have to do in order to solve this problem all day? And then it keeps them up. They bring their days into their nights and they wonder why they can't sleep. And so there's, there's, there's a lot of different ways we could go with this. But first and foremost, I think, I think it's just really important for people to understand that sleep needs to be a priority. It needs to be protected. Um, and it's, it's something that, you know, even if you're doing all the right things with your diet and your nutrition, if your sleep is off, it's going to, you're not going to, you're not going to be able to optimize your, your physical health, your mental health, your emotional health, because sleep does trickle into all these different areas. Yeah. I mean, it's such an important conversation. And why don't, why don't we talk a little bit about, uh, some of the consequences of not sleeping properly? I mean, you, you, elucidated some pretty big ones in your, in your Ted talk, which I thought was powerful statement, you know, with the Exxon Valdez and some of these like major disruptive things that potentially happen as a result of, you know, making bad decisions when we're, when we're tired, uh, all the way into different dis-ease, you know, diagnoses, et cetera, from this chronic lack of sleep. But I'd love to like, can we share some of that impact, um, from sleep deprivation? Yeah. I mean, mentally again, it's so, so we can talk mentally, physically, and emotionally. Let's kind of go like through very systematic here. So mentally, the biggest impact is your ability to make good decisions. And, you know, obviously decisions dictate our, our destiny, our, our life, everything, you know, so if you're making bad decisions, whether that's with your diet, with your business, uh, in your relationship, it's going to, it's going to impact everything. And the prefrontal cortex, that's the part of our brain that really gets, um, let's say it gets dysregulated. It gets, it, it gets diminished. You're not able to really think clearly. Everyone here listening to this has experienced a night of bad sleep and woke up and like, you're, you're just in a fog. Um, so, you know, you can't really undermine the, you know, what that creates when you're not thinking clear. 
So that's where we'll start with, with mentally, if you're not thinking clear, you're not making good decisions, that's not a good place to be in. Emotionally, there's a lot of studies that show, you know, emotionally how a lack of sleep impacts us. You just, and again, from personal experience, you wake up, or if you didn't get a great night of sleep, you wake up, you don't feel like yourself. You feel low, you feel lethargic, you feel low energy, you feel emotionally, you just feel disconnected. You know, you kind of feel like a shell of who you are, especially if this is a consistent thing. And so what is that? What is the implications of, of that is, again, relationships, both intimate and socially, you don't feel like doing things because you don't have the mental bandwidth, the capacity to be present with people. So people tend to isolate um, and get in fights with their wife. They pick, you know, they, it's kind of like if you put those, those like, the gla- yeah, I mean, I'm guilty of it. A hundred percent. It's it's like, you know, you, you you don't show up as your most stable self. And that's because you're not getting into REM sleep, which is like emotional first aid. That's when we work out the day's traumas. Um, and then physically, you know, physically, if you're not sleeping, you're not getting into these deeper stages of sleep, your body's not repairing. You know, you're not able to clear out the, you know, the cells that are damaged that need to be clear out the glimpse system, you know, the lymph system for the brain that, you know, that beta amyloid and the plaque that builds up isn't, able, you know, isn't getting flushed out. So there's a, and, and I want to be, be really careful. I don't want to scare people because oftentimes people hear me say things like this, and then it freaks them out even more. They get more anxious and then they can't sleep. So <laughs> I don't want to, but it's important for the people listening to this that aren't prioritizing sleep, that they understand that, yes, all of these things are being impacted when you don't protect it, when you don't prioritize it. Mm-hmm. It's awesome. Okay. Yeah. You know, my work with women, I usually tell them that what we do throughout the month is going to influence that end of the month cycle. And we often talk about what we're doing during the day and all the habits that we have daily are going to influence that night time. And I think it is so important to speak to what could happen if we don't make it a priority. So I know people will be scared, but it's also going to empower individuals too to understand that, okay, now that we know we can create tools and, you know, do your program or do these things to help support the system. So one big thing that shows up in our practice is sleep apnea. And I don't think a lot of people understand the effects of that and how it's actually working. And maybe you can kind of go into the science of that and what's happening and why it's so important to find out if that's something that you're dealing with. Yeah, this is a huge one. And we don't specifically deal with sleep apnea and sleep science Academy, but I do know a bit about it just because it's, it's so prevalent and it's essentially you, you stop breathing throughout the night, you have a stop breathing event. So you're not getting the oxygen that you need, which puts strain on your heart, which is linked to not only, you know, you're not getting into these deeper stages of sleep because your body either, and there's a lot of different types. So obstructive sleep apnea. So sometimes the the tongue, the myoglossus is the muscle that kind of holds the tongue in place. Sometimes that's weak or the structure of your jaws, just the way that it is. So the tongue slips back and you have, you know, essentially you have a, a little moment where you're not breathing. So you're not getting oxygen, which is really critical to, uh, to, to breathe. Right. <laughs> you know, so, so you're having these micro awakenings, um, and your, your, your oxygen starts to drop. And then again, that's a stress on the body. So, and mentally it creates when you have untreated sleep apnea and most people, number one, are not even aware that they have it. Mo- most people have it because they're obese not because it's obstructive. It's literally just because they're making all the wrong decisions. But then there are some people that are fit and skinny and, and they just, they're not aware. They never measured it. Maybe it's mild sleep apnea. Um, but yeah, it's so breathing is important, right? And breathing consistently throughout the night is important. So unfortunately this is you know, the only really great solutions available is, is a CPAP, which is essentially something that's going to open up the airways. It's forcing air so that you, ha- you don't have these stop breathing events, but there is this really cool, um, new technology app that came out. It's a daytime treatment. It's called excite OSA. And essentially what it does is it builds up through electro stimulation, the myoglossus so that the tongue doesn't slip back. They have like a 90% success rate for people that snore and for mild sleep apnea, I think it's around 50%. It's 20 minutes a day, right. put this device in. So, but besides that, if you have, you know, really bad 
sleep apnea, like your, your severe sleep apnea, unfortunately you got to wear a CPAP. And it's one of those things people are not compliant with because it's, to be frank, it sucks. You, you, you have this thing, it's on your face, it's, you know, you're in your bed and if, it's just not ideal. So I think there's going to be some really amazing new technology that comes out to help people that have sleep apnea. But this is definitely important. If you think you might have sleep apnea, go get a sleep test. Um, and if you can't afford one, there's, there's some great uh, new technology out that you can do like a home study. Well, they'll send you a device. A lot of times insurance does cover this. But yeah, if you, if you think like, for instance, how would you know if you have sleep apnea, if, if you are getting enough sleep, but you're waking up not refreshed, if you snore, that's usually not a great sign. Um, and, and if your partner hears you like gasping for air, you know, those are all signs of, Hey, please go get a sleep apnea test. Let's find out if you have it. And if you do have it, do something about it. Yeah. So important. Before we go on to something else, you, you mentioned um, obesity in your description and how that is usually like a predisposing factor to sleep apnea. Could you maybe even link um, just lack of sleep and weight gain because it's changing our hormonal picture and our satiety hormones and all these things? So maybe just kind of bringing, weaving those two together would be helpful for our listeners. Yeah. So when you're not sleeping, you know, there's, there's a lot of reasons why people gain weight when they're not sleeping. First and foremost, you know, your cortisol is goes up and it stays up. So the fat storing hormone. So, you know, and like you said, the the ghrelin and leptin, so there's the hunger and the full signaling hormones, they get dysregulated. So you're hungry and you're eating and you're craving all the wrong food, sugar and fat, and your body's not telling you that you're full because this hormone, these hormones get dysregulated. And then on top of that, you have high cortisol and that that the food that you're eating, the junk, the sweets and the fats is then getting stored because of the cortisol, the high levels of cortisol, which then again, you have high levels of cortisol. You're not going to be able to get into the parasympathetic, the rest and digest, which doesn't allow you to rest. So on and on this thing goes, next thing you know, you're, you know, again, you're, you're eating all the wrong foods and then it lowers willpower. Like think of, think of the last time that you didn't sleep well and think about the will last night. Okay. (laughs) So, you know, so you, you might notice that your willpower is a little bit less, you know, so maybe you open the fridge and, you know, maybe you have some nice dark chocolate in there, or maybe you have like an apple or, or something else. You tend to lean towards the sugar and the fat because your body wants energy. And that's what sugar and fat is. So it's your, now you're having to go against your, your body's programming because your body thinks, Hey, we need to survive. You know, you you know, something's not right here. That's why you go to the sugar and fat. So it's, you know, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a tricky situation for people um, because of the nature of what it can create that cycle. And it's um, yeah, it's, it's not a good one. It's not a good train to be on. Mm-hmm. So because in your case, you'd never really had the sleep challenges. Uh, I think you even uh, mentioned that your nickname is Narcos, which was like yeah. short for narcolepsy. So you could just sleep anywhere. It's actually funny because Sonia's dad literally can sleep standing up and it's like, he'll be wow, leaning a on, a, on a counter <laughs> and he'll literally close his eyes and be asleep and you can just kind of carry on a conversation with him and he'll eventually come back to it. But um, uh now, now, given the fact that it was, wasn't necessarily a challenge for you, um, how did you find the, the most effective way to relate to the people that were really struggling in that, in that place? Because, uh, I mean, we, we have patients, too, where that's literally their, their most difficult challenge. And so, yeah, we'd love for you to just help us help those who are really stuck to really relate to you. Yeah, so that really, the, the empathy from knowing what it's doing to them and then hearing their story. So I peep like literally every day I speak to people all over the country that can't sleep. And the most common thing that people say is I've tried everything. I still can't, and I can't sleep. Can you help me? And I said, well, let's find out. That's why we're on the phone. Um, but the stories that I've, I've heard from people about how it's ruined their health, their businesses, their relationships. Um, and really just, knowing from myself, like I don't have perfect sleep. I definitely have had nights where I have not slept and feeling the impact of just one or two nights of not sleeping great. And then kind of casting that out into weeks, 
months, years, or decades. And I can only even imagine um, the pain, the suffering that comes along with that, which you got to have, you have to have a big heart to do the work that I do because people are extremely, extremely suffering. I mean, when you're not sleeping, you're, you're, you're just not in a good place. Um, so, so that, you know, understanding that and then and hearing people's stories has allowed me to, to help guide them to a lot of times what happens though, it's, it's really people that they get stuck in this paradox. Uh, and it's, they think they've tried everything. They've, they've addressed the symptoms, but they don't understand that most of what they've tried was just addressing the symptom. It, it was, it was physical. And a lot of why people can't sleep is actually psychological, whether they realize it or not, it's, that's totally different. But most people in my experience, they heavily rely on the physical. Hey, let's, you know, optimize the, the diet and the, the, the environment, the cold, dark room, the sleep hygiene. Um, maybe even they start to do some stress reducing activities, which can be helpful, but there's still this underlying fear when people really don't sleep well, that I'm going to have to deal with this the rest of my life. And I'm broken, which until you really address that underlying fear and give people the belief that they're not broken and also give them the hope that they don't have to deal with this for the rest of their life, they're going to continue to suffer because it's those underlying thoughts that keeps the body in a state of stress mm -hmm. and a stressed body doesn't want to rest. And so yeah. it's like, there's like layers of psychology that pe get people stuck. Perfectionism, uh, putting, putting on a pedestal, like, Oh, if only I could sleep, everything in my life will get better, which is a tricky one because yeah, when you sleep, everything in your life does get better when you're not sleeping, but putting on a pedestal creates these expectation and these attachments and all these things that create this expectancy, this pressure, this desire, this need to sleep, which then creates less sleep. So there's like all these little tricky things that people fall into from a mindset standpoint that can keep them stuck. And then the stuff that people think makes sense, like spend more time in bed, like take naps, a lot of the, the things that seem to make sense that would solve the problem actually keep people stuck which is, which is frustrating for a lot of people. For sure. Yeah. I, I love that you went there because yeah. th that's just such critical information. It's so easy to start to shame ourselves or like you said, put it on a pedestal and have this expectation for how things are supposed to look and then never achieving that. I mean, that self it's, it's this self depreciating experience that just keeps recycling in one's life. So uh, I find one of the tools that, that uh, is really helpful for people is have some sort of tracking device to actually measure I can't tell you how many people um, that have moved in that direction started to go, actually, I'm sleeping better than I actually thought. And so it's part of this sort of like conditioning that we tell ourselves yeah. that, that we didn't have a good sleep. But so I'd love to hear just some of the technology, maybe, or some of the ways that you help people uh, identify wh what, how they're actually doing at nighttime. Yeah. So, so important that you brought this up. We can't manage what we don't measure. We can't master what we don't manage. I mean, so we use the aura ring. It's, you know, I'm sure you're familiar with it. It's the ring wearing on your finger measures, you know, pretty oh, he just good. He ordered another one for himself. Uh, yeah. He's familiar. I've gone through two different <laughs> yeah. iterations. Yeah, on, All right. On yeah. The they're on their third generation now. <laughs> so it? this one's going to be the best they got. I, mean, I know they got like a hundred million in funding. So I'm sure some of that money trickled into R and D and, um, so yeah, so, so having some type of measuring system is important because, you know, again, we can't, it's like, if you went and got a blood test, you have high cholesterol. Okay. Let's, let's put a plan of action together. Let's change the diet or get on medication or both. And then let's ch check it again. So just like that, you, you know, measuring your sleep. And I like the aura ring cause I, I, it is the most advanced sleep tracking device you know, there's the whoop strap and the all kinds of different devices that are out there. I like, I just like aura because it's least invasive and it seems to be the most accurate. Um, so yeah. So when you, when it's important to measure, because then you could see, Hey, I took these actions and this is, this is what that did. So I, I cut out the caffeine and while wow, I got more, you know, deep sleep or run sleep, I created a three hour fasting window between my last meal and my bedtime. And wow, I got, you know, more deep sleep. And then you can start to see it and almost kind of, you can gamify it and you can start okay. to see, 
ah, I made these changes and wow, this was the impact. And not only can you feel it, you can see it. And when people can see it, it becomes real. And you're right. People often underestimate how the quality and the amount of sleep that they're getting. This is so common and it's understandable because you're unconscious Mm -hmm. Uh, unless you're looking at the clock every time you wake up or which then creates more anxiety. How would you really know? And so tracking your sleep, but it's really important though, if you don't have the proper support and you're tracking your sleep, it can, it can backfire because now you're tracking your sleep and you're trying to fix it and you just see it stay the same or it continues to get worse and that creates more anxiety. So if you're going to track your sleep and you're somebody who has real sleep issues, make sure you're working with a doctor or an expert that can help you make sense of that data. Because it's one thing to get information and it's a whole nother thing to create a plan of action based off that information that actually makes sense. So I, I important to caveat there. Yeah. Disclaimer. So how, how much is enough sleep? And like what factors do you need to understand to know what how much sleep is enough for one individual? Like we do a lot of work with um, Ayurvedic medicine. And in there, there's different constitutions. So there's one constitution that may require more in a certain season, whereas it might be different for another one. In children, it might be different than elderly. So maybe if you can just enlighten us um, in hours, like how many hours or what factors we need to be looking at. Yeah, this is more of an art than a science because there are so many factors. There your genetics, there's your gender, there's your lifestyle. Those are the big ones. So, you know, your age. So your sleep architecture is going to change as you go throughout life. And also depending on the demands that you're putting on your body, your, your, your sleep demand is going to change. So if you're an athlete, you're going to need more sleep. If you're, you know, if you're someone that sits on the couch all day and it's not very, you know, sedentary, you're not, you're not going to need as much sleep. Um, so, and then like, like I said, your genetics. So certain people, you know, chronobiology. So the study of your unique chronotype. Are you a night owl? Are you a morning lark? Are you somewhere in between? Dr. Michael Bruce, he, he's done some amazing work on, you know, chronobiology. Uh, he kind of, he's, he, he made it fun. You know, he gave the architecture, the, these four archetypes, archetypes of uh, chrono, chronotypes. So there's, there's, I think to understand how much sleep you need, you need to experiment with it. And if, and just know if you're putting more demands on your body, whether mentally or physically, you're going to need more sleep mm -hmm. and just, you know, you sh should wake up and feel refreshed. If you wake up and you're not feeling refreshed, either you're not getting enough sleep or you're not getting enough quality sleep, uh, or there's something else going on. I oftentimes people think, well, um, I'm sleeping great, but I still feel tired and lethargic. Well, maybe there's some underlying toxicity. Maybe there's, you know, um, Maybe you're hypersensitive to something in your environment. So then you can kind of start to, to say, okay, maybe it's just not your sleep. But sleep is often a great place to look to see dysfunction. Because mm -hmm. if, if your body is able to get into a, a rested state, then that's, that's a good sign that your body's balanced, that you know, there, there aren't barriers because your body's doing what it's designed to do, which is sleep. So if you're having issues getting to sleep, there is either a barrier in your mind or a barrier in your body. Usually there's multiple barriers in both that need to be looked at. So anyway, that's a hard, I, I, I didn't really give a, a concise answer to your question because it's, it's really an art and you have to experiment with it and you have to kind of, you know, there's so many factors. So yeah. I hate to say this, but it just depends. <laughs> you know? No, I think that's the perfect answer yeah. because it takes away that expectation, right? So we always promote self-discovery because one thing may work for one individual, but it's not going to work for the other. But we have an expectation of like, hey, I need to get my eight hours and I didn't get them in today. And unless you really know you need those eight hours. Um, yeah. So I think that was a perfect answer. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it, it's kind of like the, the question that people ask, well, how many glasses of water do you need to drink a day? Well, right. you know, it really just depends on you. So that's yeah, a I think that answer great is perfect. analogy. Uh, yeah, I love that analogy. What uh, I'm curious, what archetype are you? I'm a bear. Bear. Yeah. Yeah. So do, do, you like wanna, to... do you want to do you want to describe the, the archetypes just because people are probably going to 
going on? Yeah. Now? yeah. So, um, so the, the book that Dr. Michael Bruce wrote is called the power of when, and there's four different archetypes. So there's dolphins are like the trouble sleepers. They're mostly, and I actually have people that go through our program, take his quiz and almost always they are dolphins, which is pretty to his, to his uh, credit. Um, it's, it's pretty accurate. So dolphins are the trouble sleepers, uh, most people that have, you know, in, insomnia, then there's bears. These are, this is, I think he's, it's about 40% of the population, maybe a little bit more bears are just consistent sleepers go to bed around, um, 10 PM, wake up around, you know, 7 AM. And then there is wolves, which are usually, um, late, a little bit later, you know, they work a little bit later. They need a little bit less sleep and lions. So I don't know the, the actual, how he breaks it down, but if you go to his website, I think it's power one quiz. Um, you can take the answer, some questions and then he'll let you know, you know, what type you are. Um, but yeah, I think there's probably even more than just the four that he's kind mm -hmm. of defined. And, you know, I think as time goes on and as the science gets better and genetic testing gets better, I think we're going to discover that, you know, there's a lot more than just four. Um, and it's, what's interesting about chronobiology is that our, every cell has a little clock in it. Like our organs are on a timer. Like, you know, this suprachiasmatic nucleus is like the master timer that controls sort of all the clocks, if you will. And that's one, the one that really controls sleep, but like, our whole body has this, this rhythm and knowing your rhythm and keeping that rhythm in sync, just, just like a woman would with, with her cycles and all that is important because that's, that allows the body to, to express the intelligence that it's designed with. Um, and so the problem today is a lot of times people are disconnected from that intelligence because of technology, whether it be light, whether it be stress, um, whether it be, you know, EMFs, there's all these things in our environment that haven't been around at the level that they are here, um, that really get in the way of our natural circadian clocks to function regularly. I mean, here in the States, I'm not sure if you guys in, in Vancouver have uh, daylight savings time, but like, just do that. Yeah. This, this weekend, yesterday. right? Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, it's like, talk about a change in, 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 in our sleep, adding an hour or taking away an hour, you know, it's like, that's a big deal, you know, and, and when the, you take away, when you fall back the next day, there's more heart attacks and more car crashes than I think any other day in the entire year. Um, that's because, crazy, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Which I think they should just do away with it. Like, Hey, let's just like pick one time and let's <laughs> let everybody just stay in sync versus like, given the hour and taking the hour, it's like, they're not, you know, it's not good for people's sleep architecture. I think that's like for like the farmers. I, I don't, I read at some point, the reason they did that was for farmers, but now it doesn't really make sense, but yet it's still a part of our culture and it still creates, you know, issues. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, I'm going on a tangent here. So no, no, I, <laughs> no, no. You brought up such important stuff. And it's funny that you brought up those, those stats of the heart attacks. I mean, I literally just heard that on, uh, on the radio this morning and, you know, just that alone should sort of, you know, smack people awake. It's a little bit just to show that just a one hour disruption can actually mean the difference between uh, an inf acute inflammatory event and not um, to, so it just puts some gravity, you know, and again, not to stress people, but it puts some gravity into just how important this is. And so, you know, I love that, that you're, you're focusing in on this. Uh, I'd love for you to, to share, you know, cause you've been in this game for a while, not just as a sleep coach, but a, a wellness coach and performance coach in all these different areas. Uh, what are your, some of your favorite hacks for optimizing sleep? Like, let's say we took care of some of the basic stuff, you know? What, what is optimal sleep hygiene and, or maybe some hacks that you found to be extra helpful for some of those that are really stuck? Yeah. Um, so I love putting positive stress on the body, like her hermesis, or hermosis, however you want to pronounce it. So cold exposure is, is something that I've, I've played with that I found has helped increase the quality of my sleep. Um, so I actually have a, a cold plunge in my home and, 
you know, I do a couple times a week, get in there and shock the body. Um, but it's really, the, again, this, it depends. It depends on the person because somebody that's not sleeping is in a stress state. You probably don't want to put more stress on someone that's already stressed. Um, so it really depends. But personally, I found with all the tinkering that I've done, um, incline sleeping is another one. So actually sleeping on a slight incline, not just the half of your body, but the, you know, full incline of about five degrees that definitely has helped the optimize the deep sleep. And you can just do this by putting bed risers on the front, uh, the top of your bed, um, having, you know, things that help regulate your temperature. So for me, my, my ritual is I take a hot shower and I make this uh, tea, some hot tea, and I turn on a red light and I read, I read and not in bed, but I read on the couch with a red light with my tea, um, you know, after a hot shower and I'm all relaxed and, and that's, that's what works for me. So, you know, temperature is really important and lighting is really important. So if you want to pull those levers and there's a lot of ways you could pull those levers, um, but when you get those levers pulled the right ways, definitely can make an impact as far as the, the quality of your sleep. Um, so another thing that I recently have been playing around with, I have a weighted blanket mm. and this, I was at the Bulletproof conference, which I think now they call the biohacking conference in Orlando a couple, couple weeks ago or months ago at this point. And, um, so I, I, I met the, the founder of the Chile system. And, um, so I got myself a, a weighted cooling and heated blanket. Um, and that, you know, again, these are all things I, I am, I don't have insomnia. So this is more like for the people that want to optimize the one third of their life. They want to kind of see how much deep sleep and REM sleep they can get. And they're not people that are anxious about it, that are not sleeping. Um, but yeah, so those are, those are some things. And then there are some supplements as far, you know, supplements are like the last thing you want to go to, but there are some things that can be helpful. Um, like GABA, L-theanine, hops. I love, I, there's this... I'm kind of embarrassed to share this, but there's a company that makes this hop, it's called hop tea. And I got an entire keg of hop tea <laughs> in my kegerator and it's, there's no alcohol in it, but it kind of tastes like a beer. And, um, so I drink hop tea. Um, so I do that all kinds amazing. of fun things. It, act it actually, is, yeah. so yeah, I mean, I, it's, there's, there's so many fun things you can experiment with and I, and I have fun with it. Like I, I think that we take things, especially when it comes to our health sometimes so seriously, and it puts this kind of pressure on it and this heaviness on it. And I think the best approach is just to have curiosity and be open and say, hey, let me try some hop tea and some red light and a hot shower and let's see what happens, you know, and without any expectation of it doing anything. Um, and so the book I'm reading is, is uh, Michael Pollan's How to Change Your Mind. It's on psychedelics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which is interesting. I think there's a whole. I'm I'm interested in that topic. I think that there's definitely potential to help people that have uh, insomnia using uh, you know psychedelic medicine. Um, but there's there, there's there's so much. I mean, everything in you, that you do in your day impacts how you're going to sleep at night. So there's so many things you could do, and I don't like to overwhelm people. So so, so sticking to the basics is important. So making sure that you limit your caffeine, you limit alcohol, you limit food right before bed, you're doing like anything that's good for your health is going to be good for your sleep. I mean, that's a, a really easy blanket statement. And, um, and then you can start to do some of the, the, the fun sort of hacks, like the incline sleeping and the red light therapy and the, all the other things, you know, uh, oh, mouth taping. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I mean, yeah. You know, you can well, let's, let's talk a little bit about mouth taping because I, I mean, we just, we just listened to uh, James Nestor, uh, the, the author of brief. I think it's last name is Nestor. Yeah, it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And he was talking about the, how the structure of uh, the jaw, the mouth is so different than what it is from our ancestors and the actual space between like, or where the, where breath or larynx esophagus uh, is actually lessened because our jaw is it used to be like more protruding, more forward facing, and and it was wider before, and now it's basically condensed and more pushed back. So it's, there's this natural um, regression to that space in the back of our throat. And so he was talking about just breath work 
and a lot of the stuff um, to actually improve that that oxygen capacity through into the lungs. Uh, but but he did bring up mouth taping, so we'd love to hear your perspective uh, on on using that as a tool. I think it's a great strategy, especially if you're someone who is a mouth breather, which I was. And so when you, this is definitely, if, if there's something that you take away from this experiment with mouth taping, it, it absolutely make a difference. Cause if you breathe through your nose, you're getting more nitrous oxide, you're filtering the air. Um, you get, you're going to have better breath. You're going to have deeper sleep. And it's so easy just to, you know, tape your mouth shut for, you know, not ever, right. It's just, you just train your body. That was, I was on another podcast this week and, and I was, we were talking about mouth taping and the guy's like, yeah, but you know, in the middle of the night, I would just rip it off and I wouldn't be aware. I like do it unconsciously in the middle of you know, my sleep. And I'm like, ah, oh, you know, but, um, you might need to get like some more like duct tape and just go all the way around here. Um, but that is, you know, again, that's, that's something fun you can play with that I think would make a difference. It's not great for intimacy. I can tell you that much. The first time I came into the bedroom with mouth tape, my wife was like, what are you? (laughs) I'm like, I like my weighted blanket. Yeah. Well, I had to get my own because it was like, (laughs) here's where her line of sleeping ends and begins. And so I had to create my own, I guess. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Blankets are powerful though. I mean, when she got it, I, I, I mean, it, it was lights out for you, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. The first time you started yeah. using weighted blanket. The red light. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It, hel- it helped you. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there's, there is a lot of studies. I think there's certain types of people that like weight on their bodies. Like I like weight on my body. My wife does not. So like somebody that doesn't like feeling, some people feel like claustrophobic if they have weight on their body. Other people feel like you're getting hugged. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, personal preference there, but there are studies on weighted blankets um, again, these are like the tangible things, the environmental things they can help, but a lot of it really is the site. It's, you want to be careful not to fall into like the looking for the silver bullet. Like, Oh, if I just had a weighted blanket and a red light, like my sleep would be amazing. It's like, probably not like those things might help, um, the quality of your sleep. But if you have an issue, either getting or staying asleep, they're not going to be the things that are really going to make the difference. So it's, it, there's a distinction. So quality of sleep versus actual like insomnia, like have, having trouble falling or staying asleep, or if you wake up initiating sleep again, two different demographics. And depending on what we're talking about, you know, this, the quality of sleep conversation might actually not be good for the people that have insomnia because now they believe that they need to do something in order to sleep, which is not true. Yeah. Right. And then there's an attachment to that thing too. So if you go away and you don't have your weighted blanket or these right. elements that help that you think help you, then that's going to create more stress. We yeah. call those crutches at sleep science Academy. That's like, yeah, you got to have another suitcase with all your, like your sleep stuff, like your weighted blanket, your red light in it. You're like your supplements, your you know, like, with the oils. Yeah. yeah you're like, Oh, I need to have all this in order to sleep. If I don't, you know, yeah. um, which is not true. Like the body, the body knows how to sleep. It's just, there's, there's barriers in the mind and there's barriers in, 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 that can happen in the body that then become habits. Oftentimes sleep challenges are really just habits that need to be broken mentally and physically. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's huge. Yeah. yeah. So I have a last question for you. Um, it looks like you're doing amazing work in the world and sleep, I think is the most important foundational element that supports all aspects of our life that we just spoke about in the last hour. Um, for yourself, if you knew that, you know, today was your last day on earth, what would be the message or the imprint that you would like to leave for the world? Man, that's a, that's a, that's a heavy question. A heavy um, question. Yeah. Yeah. So like my parting gift to the world, is that kind of the, the theme yeah. here? Um, I think it would be the practice of acceptance and letting go. That actually, believe it or not, is not only transformative to your sleep, but just to every aspect of life. We are have a really hard time, I think, accepting things that we don't want um, things and often how much of life is what we don't want. It's just life happens. And then we're in resistance to it. And we have a really hard time letting go, letting go of anger, frustration, grudges, judgments. So 
I would say my parting words or, or what I would hope for the people that were still on earth would be to, for people to really practice the art of acceptance and, and letting go, because I know they'd be so much more equipped to deal with life and it would help them sleep better and it would help them live better. So that would be, that would be it. Thank you. That's beautiful. It's powerful. Yeah. <laughs> Especially right now. I mean, uh, just the world that we live in is just, it's very challenging. And, and I know that many people um, do get attached to the things that they believe, the judgments they have towards themselves and others. And it's really an important message for, for the times we're in. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. yeah. And it, the, the reason why we ask this question at the end is that you, know, we ourselves that are helping others sometimes can get wrapped in the expectation of getting validated through that help that we're giving. And that becomes our identity. And, I think when we start to really look at the bigger picture of what we're actually doing through the work that we're doing, it just, it changes that relationship too. For sure. There's, there's, it's so easy to get your self-worth attached to achievement, Mm -hmm. right. Or outcomes for clients, um, you know, and that's not going to serve them or you. Right. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's conditioned. That's a, that's a cultural condition program in the matrix that you know it's like you gotta unplug yeah, yeah. <laughs> all in the illusion yeah well speaking of plugging how can people plug more into uh your academy uh you obviously there, there's the book they can access uh you've got social media accounts on so instagram but please just share where everyone can go to access all of the stuff that you deliver yeah so sleep science academy um the sleep quiz sleep webinar you can get a consult free consult there sign up for a consult um you know, social media, YouTube, I'm not huge on social media. I try to pretend like I am, but I really, <laughs> I'm not, but I, I, I do uh, post I'm there with you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a balance, right? It's, it's, um, but it's, uh, I do, I do try to share things that I think would be, inspire people either from my personal life or from, you know, as far as like content goes, um, mostly on, on YouTube and, and Instagram. Um, but yeah, that's that's where you can connect with me but sleep science academy that's where if you if you need support that's that's where i would say to to check it out what i have awesome so we'll put all that in the show notes and and i think it's you know it's a great offer for people listening i mean many people that tune in you know need that extra help and sometimes you know in in a conversation or doing a course that devin offers you're going to be able to find a whole lot of stuff that you just weren't paying attention to and that's that's you know that's how we get better that's how we heal that's how we take care of ourselves is by knowing thyself and to uh to implement self-discovery so love it devin thank you so much uh you're you're a legend in this in this field and we're just so grateful for for the conversation today um thank you for having me and allow, allowing me to share with your audience and, and the people that are you know you guys are inspiring and guiding so thanks thanks for having me and thanks for the work that you're doing i, I appreciate it awesome